You're listening to the podcast of the Academy of Professional Celebrants, the UK's premier celebrant training provider. Whether you're an established celebrant, if you're just starting out, or if you're wondering if it's the career for you, our podcast is here to inspire, to help you tap into the knowledge and experience of our many celebrants and the wider industry. So, join with our host, Derek Duncan, as we dive into the world of celebrancy, sharing with you tips and advice from our extensive network of celebrants and others in the industry. We are the Academy of Professional Celebrants. We are here for you. Your success is our success. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Academy of Professional Celebrants podcast. We hope that the podcast continues to be a source of inspiration for you and that you find some useful tips in the conversation that follows. If you would like to take part in future podcasts, please email me at derek at apcuk.org. I'm your host, Derek Duncan, and joining me today is Neil Jeffrey. Neil is a former successful business consultant with over 20 years of experience working with clients around the world. Throughout their consulting career, Neil thrived in a fast-paced environment, helping businesses achieve their goals and navigate complex challenges. While this role was incredibly fulfilling, Neil felt that something was missing, a final piece of the jigsaw that would bring even greater purpose to their work. That's when Neil discovered the world of celebrancy with a special focus on funeral celebrancy, having trained with the Academy of Professional Celebrants. This new path allowed them to blend their extensive business skills with a deeply meaningful vocation. Today, Neil uses their expertise in communication, problem solving and project management to help families during one of life's most challenging moments creating personalised and heartfelt experiences that honour and celebrate lives. His strapline is life crafting memorable moments for every journey. In this episode, we'll explore Neil's journey from business consultant, counsellor and hypnotherapist to celebrant and how this has shaped their perspective on life, loss and the power of connection. Whether you're interested in celebrancy, contemplating a career change, or simply curious about how diverse skills can come together in unexpected ways, you're in for an enlightening conversation. So, without further ado, let's welcome Neil Jeffrey. Hello, Neil. Good afternoon, Derek. Lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you. Neil, I hinted at in my introduction but I wondered if you might tell us some more about your interesting career and what it was that made you want to become a celebrant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a great believer in, you know, I, the word journey is is in everything which I do. Um, and everything which we do in life prepares us for where we need to be next. And so I started off uh, in, in uh, IT sales, selling corporate licensing around the globe, um, very lucrative financially. And in my early teens and early 20s, I absolutely loved it. Uh, And then as I got a bit older, maybe a bit wiser, got married and had some children, I kind of thought, actually, it's not that satisfying just generating money by, you know, selling ones and zeros, as it were. And so I looked for ways to find fulfillment in my work. And I discovered that I was good at training other people to be better sales professionals. So I did that for a little while. And that, I got a sense of, I really enjoy actually connecting, working with people. That led me into more generalised coaching and then eventually business consultancy, where I'd work from everybody from kind of the, the, the janitor of the building to the chief exec and helping improve the business. And I found that, as you said in the introduction, exciting, challenging, all those words. Um, but it got to a point where if you'd asked me down the pub on a Friday night, what do you do for a living? I would have said, well, I tend to help rich people get richer. <laughs> And when I realized that, that sense of satisfaction was triggered again. It's like, why am I really doing it? It it wasn't quite for me. But I knew at that stage that I developed this deep interest in helping people. Because in business, if the business owner or the staff member's head's in the wrong place and they can't cope, they'll never be great in business. So I thought, oh, I want to go a bit further. 
I then, almost by chance, was having a coffee with a good friend of mine who had been made redundant. Been made redundant in his late 50s, was finding it difficult to find work. And he said, I, I found a new career. And I goes, well, what are you doing? And he went, I'm going to become a celebrant. And I went, what's that? I didn't really know anything about what celebrancy was or what you could or you couldn't do. And I was having a chat with him and I thought, that actually sounds really rewarding. And I could see the through line of my past experience to where I'd like to go in the future. But it's interesting. I talk about this sometimes with the funeral directors. At that point, I had the head connection. I could see all the right reasons for doing it, but there was still something lacking. For me personally, just over 12 months ago, I then lost both my parents within four weeks of each other. And for a lot of us, I guess, it's only when you lose someone close and you have to arrange your funeral and get involved that you start looking at the funeral industry, that you engage with a celebrant and you see how it really works. And that process, heart connection. So I had the business logic reason why I do it, and this gave me the heart connection. So then having completed my training, I kind of at that stage was still kind of think, maybe I'll be doing, um, you know, maybe I'll do weddings with the occasional funeral. It's, but when I looked and started doing the training, what I realized is that for me personally, the most important thing we need to celebrate is, is going to be a funeral. Because we may get married more than once. You can have lots of children, but it's the one event we're only going to do the once. Yeah. And so that really keyed me into, actually, I want to focus upon a funeral celebrancy. And, and the one event where the person is absolutely the centre of attention, possibly for the one and only time in their life, everybody is focused on them and on their story. So doing that right is is really important. You can do it with your head, but if you can do it with your heart and your head, um, then you're making a connection with your family. Absolutely. And I think that's for me, that's always been the key is when the head and the heart align, then I know I am where I'm meant to be. And so I've taken that throughout my career. It's kind of like when the, those aren't aligned, it's time for me to make a change and see what do I want to do next. And the through line for me is, is my background is working with tech companies. Because I've gone from an industry which is very kind of like machine-led, very dry and clinical. And I've developed this thing that I want to work with people. I want to help people. I want to support people. And that follows all the way through line to what I think is the natural conclusion for, if you like, one phase of my life. And the start of the next, which was now I can give all of my attention to, to people. And you chose to train with the Academy of Professional Celebrants. Um, what was that experience like and what brought you to the company in the first place? Okay, so the, the easy one is um, when I spoke to my friend who I mentioned earlier, he had also come through and did the training with the APC. So you've got one like, green tick in the, the approval box there. Um, but like a big, good, you know, good consultant, I then went to the market and I looked around at all the various different providers which exist out there. And for me, what made the APC stand head and shoulders above the rest were their approach to us as learners. They treated us with respect from when you gave them your email address. Yeah, there wasn't a single spam email or communication, no hidden cross sell or upsell. It's kind of this is what we do. If this is right for you, we will work together. And I really love that approach because these days in 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 business and in technology, um, you know, too often it's like, you know, you see one price, there's a hidden fee, you get 25 emails and no one ever leaves you alone. So I think that was kind of like made personal endorsement, great shop, shop window kind of advertising by not being pushy. And then the experience of the event. I, I, I am a very jaded trainer. I've delivered over 10,000 <laughs> hours of training via workshops and seminars. I've written courses for the UK government to help people start up businesses. So if there's one person sat in that classroom, if it's not up to scratch, would have straight away gone, oh my God. And it was amazing. Uh, I think I told Stuart immediately afterwards. I thought it was you know, some of the best training I've ever done. Excellent. Um for us, as a company, aftercare is an important aspect of our business, and you started to allude to it there. Have Have you tapped into any of the aftercare that the academy provides, and and how have you found it? I'm finding the quality of all the resources are very consistent. You know, sometimes you may get like one piece which is brilliant and a bit which is mediocre. So I think the fact that the standard is consistent. So at the moment, I've been mostly consuming some of the pre-recorded video content and obviously podcasts. Yes. Um, and as well as that, what I find very useful is, and I know we're going to talk about this later, but actually kind of the online community. 
Because what's really great about the online community is that there are celebrants with every level of experience, covering every type of service that you can imagine. And it's a, and you know, there's lots of us there, which means you can ask a question and you won't just have to wait three days for a response. You'll get a response the same day. And very often you'll get multiple responses. And also, which is the strength to people believing in the community, people will reach out. They say, do you want to have a chat? We can do a Zoom call. If you're in the area, let's meet for a coffee. So I think, it, you know, top to bottom so far, A star. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're going to be looking at making that easier to meet up for coffee so that celebrants will know how many other celebrants we've trained are, are in their area going forward. So um, look out for, for features like that. Um, you are actually the first podcast interview that I've recorded since the launch of the much vaunted new app. So you seem to be quite active on that app, Neil. Um, how are you finding it? And how might it be seen, do you think, as an improvement on the previous WhatsApp group that we we operated? I think the WhatsApp group um, was very functional. Uh, because we have the ability to tag com um, tag categories, it means that we've now suddenly got the ability that we can search more rapidly for what we're looking for. Rather than having to scroll up and down an endless list of communication, you can now go, actually, this is about funeral celebrants, say, bam, and then we, we shortcut to that area. Um, I also think visually it's just a little bit cleaner, you know, and I also think, yeah, um, you know, down the side there, you've got kind of scorecards and you've yes. got a little scorecard. Everybody wants to, oh, I do I get some more points? So that also increases engagement. Um, yeah, no, I, it's, it's definitely a step up from, from WhatsApp, just on that fact that I can find what I want when I want it, without it being a case of, oh, I, I saw something Derek put up but it was maybe 10 days ago, then sit there endlessly scrolling down the WhatsApp to try and find it. Yeah. And you can also use the calendar on it to book in for CPD or um, the new Celebrant Connect that Bernie um, Martin is hosting. So um, it's useful in that way as well. You don't need to scroll through loads of things to find CPD courses. It's there on the calendar on the app. So um, one of the conversations that you did get involved with in the app is when you outlined in, that in your view, persistence has been the key in getting set up in your celebrancy business. And I wondered if you could talk to us about how you showed that persistence and, and how long it's taken to bear fruit, which I know yeah. it has. Yeah. Well, well, I think persistence in business is the key universally. So it's not just unique to celebrancy. I think it's all things. So these won't be exact figures, but they're approximations from, from my memory. So looking at my like local geographical area and the distance I was prepared to travel with crematoriums ended up with a list of um, 36 funeral homes. So I visited 36 funeral homes. And having visited 36 funeral ho homes within a month, because if we acknowledge the fact that there are more than one celebrant in any given area, which there will be, you need to make sure that you're front and center of your mind. And the nature of it is, is that the, the funeral directors want to match you to the family. So if they don't get a chance to get to know you, how are they ever going to match to a family? Oh, that random celebrant who came in once. Whereas the first visit, it's just like, you know, you phoned up first, booked an appointment. I'm Neil. This is what I do. Here's my pack. Mm -hmm. And then you go back the second time. It's kind of like, okay, they know a bit more about you. And it's kind of like the conversation's broader. So I always, in those situations, when I leave those meetings, I'll make a note. So if someone says, like, I visited one funeral director and he said his son was coming in to do work experience in two weeks. So I'll just make a note of it. And then when I go back in a month time and he just remembered who I am, I think, oh, how was your son's work experience? So suddenly I've shown a bit of interest in him. He's likely to show it in me. And then I find that when you do that third visit, not only can you continue to build on that rapport building, but they also begin to realise that if they don't give you any work, I'll be back in four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so so I think all those things kind of stack together. And I think in, in where I went with that is when I looked at the volume of celebrants that I could identify worked in my geographical area, let's give it a number. Say there's 25 of them, 25 covering the same type of area as me. When I then looked at who was delivering the funeral service, a bit of market research, it was only about eight to nine people. So there's 25 in the area, eight or nine getting all of the work. So it's a busy market but I can get some of that work. 
I just need one of you know one service from each of those eight, and I have a viable business. So persistence. I think it's key for all businesses, but in celebrancy, absolutely. And you mentioned there that you you did your research and you found out how many um, celebrants were operating in your area and also how many celebrants were getting the service. How how did you conduct that research? How did you find that information out? So I reached out to two or three local celebrants just to have chat in conversations and ask them lots of questions and then use that to go for other meetings and conversations. I then also, because I did have a friend who was a celebrant and because I was aware that you know, you, you don't do a training program and you leave that site to ready to do the job. Then a month or so goes past, your confidence naturally will drop a little bit. So I spoke to one of my friends and I said, do you mind if I come and just shadow you at a service just so that I can keep it off front of my mind? What I then found is when I turn up to the service, there's video boards outside which show the services and who are conducting them so I can check the names. Okay. And so once you know where the crematoriums are, you know where you can find the names, you can start to look. Uh, and obviously, you can do a little bit, a bit, a bit of research in, in other slightly more devious ways. <laughs> <laughs> and are you, are you finding in your area that, that it is mostly celebrants that are leading services or are there a large amount of clergy-led services? It, so I found it divides kind of into three. So And, it, and it's area-specific. So some areas, if the community are older, i.e. people in their, their late 70s and 80s, tend to be predominantly church, so they'll be clergy. You then have other areas where the majority of services are cremations, predominantly celebrant-led with some ministers. And then the third category is, it was, uh, it was a great example given to me by a funeral director. They said, we've got a celebrant, I'll call him for arguments like Kevin, and Kevin used to be an Anglican minister. So depending on what they want, we'll say we want Rev Kev, or less rev, Kev. So <laughs> people who kind of straddle the two camps. Yeah. So you've had your first funeral um, recently, and I know that there are going to be many funerals that follow um, for you, but how did you feel you were set up for it? How did you feel that the Academy of Professional Celebrants had you ready for that first funeral? Uh, I think the, the key thing is that I thought it was very clever, and I've talked to a couple of funeral directors about this, is that um, obviously when you're doing a training programme, you can't simulate the pressure you'll feel for doing a real funeral service. But what Stuart did, which was very clever, was he spends a huge amount of time telling you the importance of the family meeting, all the questions you need to answer, how do you use that? So he builds this up in our heads. And then effectively, it gives you a very short pace of time to write that survey to deliver it the following morning. Yes. So I think that was a great way of, of giving you a little bit of pressure where it's hard to generate it. Um, and also, and then behind that is all the resources. In the folder, on the online drive, and then even beyond that, maybe something which is less I needed to draw upon because of my previous background as a presenter. But just the fact knowing... That if you had a problem, you could drop an email to either you or Stuart and say, "Can I have a chat?" You yeah, know, I can't. I can't think off my head of any other training provider where you can literally go. I'm just going to get in contact with the boss, and they'll support you. And so I think that's also part of why the APC is somewhere where I will be renewing my membership. Without you know, without any hesitation. Excellent, excellent. We're going to take a short break. But if you're listening to this podcast, then the Academy of Professional Celebrants is the UK's premier training provider, as Neil has deftly outlined for us there. We offer training in person or online in all aspects of celebrancy. And as Neil has suggested, we'll look after you every step of the way after you've completed your training. So please visit our website to find out where and when training is taking place. We'd love you to become a part of our ever-expanding Celebrant family. And remember, if you want to take part in a future podcast, please email me at derek at apcuk.org. Neil and I are going to take a short break and we'll be back with you shortly. 
In recent years, the number of celebrants in the UK has seen a significant rise. What was once an unfamiliar role is now more widely recognised as the job title of celebrant, with a basic understanding of their responsibilities. With this surge in celebrants, the question arises, are there now an excessive number? Facebook hosts numerous groups for celebrants, ranging from open to private invite-only groups for specific training organisations like the APC. These groups serve as valuable resources as celebrants, facilitating idea exchange, seeking assistance and networking opportunities. They also provide a platform for celebrants to express their views on various topics, including the recurring debate on whether there are too many celebrants and if training organisations should limit their programmes. However, both of these assertions are unfounded. As a training organisation and professional body, we will continue to train celebrants despite opinions suggesting an oversaturation. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Clients choose celebrants for various reasons, including their flexibility in accommodating individual preferences within ceremonies. Not all celebrants offer the same services, as some may lack knowledge or experience in specific lifestyle or ceremony requirements. The presence of more celebrants offers clients a wider range of choices, providing clients with options. Just as there are multiple coffee shops in any town or shopping area, each catering to different preferences, celebrants offer clients a range of services, from well-known chains offering consistent experiences to independent shops with unique offerings. There is something for everyone, competition and opportunity. When considering opening a new coffee shop amidst established ones, some may view it as a challenge, while others see it as an opportunity to attract customers. It all comes down to supply and demand. Question what you hear and see. While some established celebrants may express concerns about an oversaturation of celebrants in a specific area, this is not a common issue. Such concerns may stem from worries about losing business rather than genuine interest in the training investments of others. It is essential to verify information and form your own opinions. Stay tuned for more updates arriving very soon. The Academy of so welcome back to the podcast of the Academy of Professional Celebrants. Remember, if you want to take part in a future podcast or if you have any thoughts on what you might want me to explore in future, then email me at derek at apcuk.org and we'll try and get something organised. Neil, I'd like to tap into your vast experience in business and explore with you some of the areas that often come up in conversation with with our academy members. So the first question in this half is very straightforward. The answer might not be straightforward, it might be more involved, but what would you say are the keys to success for any business? So I would say that the number one thing really is it it actually starts in the thought processes, probably even before they've built the training programme. The first thing to really think about with any business is what it has to deliver for you. So is this a part-time income? Yeah, do you have another business and this is a side thing stream or is it your full-time income? You have to then be realistic about, okay, if I need an income of X thousand per month, how hard do I have to work to get that? And is that sustainable or practical for me? So it's always a case of, you know, you you, you may have an aspiration uh, and then you go, right, that's fantastic. I could do the hours, but then it's about, can I find that volume of work What's my runtime? So I don't put that really succinctly. Standard business advice would be, before you launch your business, you should have six months of finance, both personal and business, in the bank before you launch. Yeah. So we would expect the business to lose money until it, and then not break even until probably month five or six. Very few people who launch their business can do that. You know, in reality, most people want to be earning money within a couple of months. So if you need a part-time income, I would suggest that becomes easier in a shorter time. If you need a full-time income from celebrancy, it will take you longer to get to that revenue level. So being realistic about what you can achieve. Your company name, Neil, is Life Journeys Celebrant. Can you explain the thinking behind that name and also your strap line, crafting memorable moments for every journey. Um, where where did that strap line come from? Well, for me, the 
again, this synergy between where I've been in the past and where I'm going in the future. So I've always believed that life is about the journey. Yeah, because whenever you think about you set yourself a goal or a target in life, when you achieve it, we don't just rest on our laurels. We refocus, we pick a next goal to aim for, and we start a new journey. So for me, journeys are, are what life and experience is about. And I think when it comes to funerals, it's also the fact that the it's not just the journey of the deceased, that their, their journey with us is ended on the physical plane, whether it carries on the spiritual, that's for the individual to know or not. But it's about the people who attend those services. I knew for from my own direct experience that when I lost my parents, I was in the process of arranging the certificates, the probate, sorting out the funeral, organising all those things. And for me, a milestone on that journey was the service. It was when the service was complete that I could then actually start to grief. And so I think that is a journey, which is whether it's a wedding, a, a birth or a funeral, it's like these are our little milestones, our stepping stones, but things go on. So for, and, for me, it's all about that continuance. And as celebrants, we also play a kind of pivotal role in all of that, not just by delivering the service, but when we arrive with the family, it's often the first chance that the family have had really to talk about their loved one because of all the things that you're talking about there in terms of probate and death certificates and visiting the funeral director. Is and, their we're first... focusing, and we're focusing on the good stuff. Yeah. We can just tell me about X or Y. What were they like? And yeah. you're getting those those funny stories, those anecdotes. Uh, they often, I find, um, you know, there's, there's a little element of dark humour there as well because it's kind of like... These are people who hopefully were loved and, and led, led uh, a rich and varied life. So I, so that's kind of where the journey comes from. So it kind of like, uh, okay, it links to previous experience and is relevant where we are. And obviously for me, it's like, it is about crafting uh, memorable moments because I can remember, uh, I think Stuart said it, I've definitely had a funeral director say it to me, which is that if we get our job right, those moments live in the memories of those people for years to come. And that's a huge responsibility to get that right. So it's got to be crafted. It's got to be tailored. It's got to be bespoke. And when you do that and you get a lovely response from a client saying, well, that was amazing service. It's like, you know, that, that, you know, that reaffirms for me that you're doing the right thing because it's about them. It's not about, you know, the funeral directors may engage us, but it's about the families. It's about the deceased and it's about helping them carry on with their journey. See, journeying again. <laughs> and it, it's when their friends begin to make the journey out of the crematorium and they're maybe chatting with you and they say things like, uh, and how did you know X? And you know that you didn't know X, but then you've done your job really well because they think that you're part of that friendship group. And that's a really special um, feeling yeah. and a really, really special words as well. Absolutely. You also have... A very simple, but a very effective logo for your business. Now, we're in a podcast where nothing can be seen. So could you maybe describe your logo and, and tell us what it what it means from your point of view? Absolutely. Luckily, it's a very straightforward logo, like you said, and most people should be able to grasp it from my description. It is your classic Valentine's style heart in a very pale green. And the play really, icon heart, emotion and love and connection and the green because it's a it's a pastely color and a natural color almost like life is kind of like evergreen the reason it's simple is because it will it is remembered because of its simplicity we don't overcomplicate our branding if at all possible because our, uh, it's it's, a, it's more about uh, this great word congruence if your website yeah. your business card your logo they all say the same thing which is about quality which is normally simplicity. Yes. And then they pick that up at a subconscious level and hopefully attract more business. Yeah, I had a look at your website and it all looks really clean and the logo and, and the strap line are there. And I imagine that's in your business cards and leaflets and everything oh, else. Oh, yes. So. Fully, fully, fully branded, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I think that's just a case of consistency. You know, I have a conversation with one funeral director and he said, what would make you different from, from this other celebrant? And I think that's the most silly and unfair question to ask because we're just two unique human beings. 
But what I could say to him is I could say I I I I collect pens. Maybe it makes it a bit sad, but I collect fountain pens. And so I could say I can show you a nice big biru, which costs you 99p. It writes, it does messages, it's fantastic. Or I can show you one of my Mont Blanc pens, which cost over a thousand pounds. Materially, they both do exactly the same thing. But if you showed someone the ballpoint pen and you showed them the Mont Blanc pen, the difference in quality of the experience is evident. And it's like, okay, what does that, you know? And so that's what I always think when it comes to branding is about, I just want to make sure that when people look at what I'm offering, it makes sense. Um, and people get it wrong in silly ways. So I remember once I was um, on a project with a tech company where my role was to basically trash the competition, you know, not illegally, but in, in a like, yes. how do we compete them? And I literally phoned them up. And when I answered the phone, the guy, the other said, all right, mate, how can I help? And I just hung up. I said, we don't need to compete. It's easy. They can't even answer their telephones correctly. Yes. So I'm a great believer that the small incidental details we can add on to our service is what, with the persistence, are the bit which goes, oh, that makes sense. Uh, and being upfront with people as well about everything. So one of the peculiarities I had is um, because of my other business, it meant that I'm VAT registered. And obviously, funeral directors are not VAT registered. It's not a VATable service. And therefore, when I bill, if I bill at the same rate of every other um uh, every other person in my region, I would always be 20% more expensive because of that. So okay. rather than just kind of like going, well, I'll go in at 230, add the 20 on, I'd be the same price. That would have worked. I would have got the business, but I would have missed the business trick. The way to correctly layer that, I think of quality and congruence, is I said, look, I'm that registered, which means I need to charge VAT. But what I'm going to do for you is you'll see my full price, but I'm going to give you a discount of 20%. And by doing it that way, I maintain the value of my brand. If you just drop your price to make it fit, not only does that devalue other celebrants, because you could say, hey, if Neil would do it by this, why can't you knock 20% off? But I'm saying I'm doing this because I'm lucky. I'm in a position that I can do it because my other business means that I'm that registered, which is not your problem, it's mine. Mm -hmm. And just for celebrants out there who are thinking of answering the phone by saying, all right, mate, how can I help you? <laughs> how how should that business have answered their phone? <laughs> well, you've got to think about who your customer is going to be. So I think you've just got to say, I say, I say, good afternoon, Neil speaking. How can I help you? It's just professional. Yeah, you know, it, it's, They do the same thing. People do the same as social media. Don't do social media and talk as a business as you talk to your friends down the pub. Those messages stay around forever and, and they're going to haunt you. So you've always got to just kind of think, you know, if, if I was working with a large company, what would they want me to do? And we can we can live those qualities. Because again, think about celebrancy. It's in real terms, a very traditional sector. Often with funeral directors, there's a lot of family history. So they're quite traditional. So we don't want to be all uh, you know smart and fancy. Saying, yeah, I have all my services written by AI. You know, that, that yes. that's going to be nonsense. But if you kind of like say, you know, I've got a degree in English literature and I've done this and I've done this and here's me, you know, so always in that response, whether it's on the phone or in person, match it to what they would expect. What you can offer to their business as well, going forward, how you can help them, not just how you can be the pizzazzy celebrant with all singing and all dancing kind of um, stuff behind you. In terms of the brand, where should we be displaying our brand? How 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 far and wide should our brand be displayed? Well, I think this is the interesting one, isn't it? Because we're, we're now in that kind of area of, uh, of how do we market ourselves as celebrants. So the first thing I would say is don't overcomplicate these things. And what I mean by that is um, too often what people will do is they'll spend a month working on their LinkedIn profile or their Facebook page to grow their business. When at the beginning, I would say, just pick up the phone, book appointments and visit funeral directors. You know, you're wasting your time at the start of your journey, focusing all of your effort on a digital strategy. Because, um, again, business lesson, when you are marketing on Facebook, you're marketing for attention. Because that's what's happening. You're saying, I do celebrancy. Someone searches for celebrants and you comes up. That person isn't necessarily in need of a celebrant today. They might need a celebrant next year. So it's like, ah, so when we market on Facebook, we're marketing for attention. Google AdWords, which is the other one people will sometimes use, there you're advertising for custom. 
because the difference is on Google, I search and I need a funeral celebrant. Bam. The advert which is fed to me is a celebrant I can book today. They're a buy now customer. So don't spend all your time marketing for attention because in most cases, a celebrant, we don't want everybody in Abu Dhabi knowing that we're funeral celebrants, which Google would be very good at doing for us. We want the funeral directors within 25, 30 minutes drive of us. Yes. So build your brand, be consistent in terms of, yeah, get that that logo to match what's on your business card. Um, spend a bit of money on a business card. Um, you know, as much as some people like them, I can smell a Vista print card from 50 feet. So I'd say go for a slightly higher quality business card. Make sure it matches your website. Think of um, the way you present yourself. Yeah. I don't think many people who would go and visit, a, guys this is, who would visit a funeral director and not be wearing at least shirt, trousers and shoes. Yeah. You know, I think if you go in as a guy and you're wearing a pair of scruffy jeans and a T-shirt, you could probably expect that you're not going to get a lot of business. So understand your market and present yourself in all ways. If you're consistent in that sense, then I'd say a good business card, website for visibility, because if you've got a card, people will look at your website. So it's like they need to match. But outside of that, I think do the basics. Get out there, visit, talk to people, and be visible. There's nothing like you being there in person for the funeral director to to get to know you and 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 to give give you absolutely. business. Absolutely. And then, and then with time build your digital strategy. Have a blog. I mean what I did again this is why sometimes like I said sort of where does it start? It starts before you do your training. And Stuart will remember this because on the day that I was um on the course, he got me to show my website to everybody and I've always got 3 months worth of blogs on it. Because I'd started doing my market research and talking about what I wanted to do months before I launched my business so that by the time I arrive if people just casually look at it, it's like, oh, it looks like I've already got a bit of trading history there. Yeah. So been at it for that, months. Yeah. So yeah. do that as a long tail. But I think it's too often what people will do is they'll rely on um, kind of the digital space because it's easy, because we do it from home and it's anonymous. And we don't have to talk directly to people. And we'll think we can grow our business that way. And I, and I think that's going to be incredibly hard in funeral celebrancy. I think it may be slightly easier to do in a, as a wedding celebrant, although I would suspect with wedding celebrancy, there's going to be a lot of digital competition. You know, a lot of people out there will, will recognise that they need to pay to advertise to get through the noise. And so again, it's like that maybe. So I'm a great believer in looking at kind of the supply chain. So if I was a wedding celebrant, I'd be talking to venues, florists, and wedding planners. That's who I would talk to. I wouldn't. I still wouldn't be doing the digital strategy first. So yeah, a great believer. Let's let's use traditional shoe leather strategies. A really great way to get things moving. And how much shoe leather do you get through, Neil? <laughs> well, I bought two new two new shoes, sets of shoes for funerals, but that's by the by. Yeah, um, yeah it, I mean, it doesn't have to take. Um, you know, I've I've probably had the luxury that with my existing business, it supports my my outreach. So I've created more work for myself by covering a broader geographical area. Basically, what I did was I looked at my geographic area, so I'm based in the West Country, and I went, I'm going to travel down no further than this crematorium. And then I figured, if I want to go to that crematorium, I've got to lay myself 15, 20 miles the other side of it for okay. families. And therefore, I effectively then started to work out what's the maximum area I could get. So you could pick eight, nine funeral directors in the area you definitely want to work and limit yourself to those. Because I'm me... When I'd visit those people and I was waiting, I couldn't, you know, if I visit them all in a week, I can't go every week. That really upsets people if you turn up every week. So I thought I need to have three weeks worth more of work. So I did another three rounds further out. When you're setting up a new business and celebrants have to to make a decision on this, um, they have to decide whether they want to set up as a sole trader or a limited company. But it's not always the case that um, somebody who's entering celebrancy knows exactly what those terms mean. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about which wh what each of those terms mean and which of them would be better suited to a celebrant and why. So I'll, I'll do those two and a third, which kind of sits between the two. Brilliant. The principal difference between a sole trader and a limited company is about personal liability. So if as a celebrant, you were to be sued for whatever, and it wasn't covered by the public liability insurance, which you had, and it was suddenly decided that you owed lots of money, as a sole trader, you are solely liable, the clues in the name. 
And that effectively would mean that they could come after your personal assets. So if you own property or a new spanky sports car, they can come and take those away for, for a business failure. If you're a limited company, then the limited company in the eyes of the law is actually a physical being. It's almost like a, your child. So a limited company, liability sits and resides within that business. So if the business makes a mistake, and the assets are not within the business, then they would just, they can't claim them back and your personal assets are protected. I would imagine that for the vast majority of celebrants, um, sole trader is the way, all of the way, because they're unlikely to have the type of liability uh, concerns that you may have in another business. You're not carrying, you know, £100,000 worth of stock or, or whatever. Um, some people like limited liability because maybe they're starting to celebrate and they go, actually, I want to buy a new car. And I've heard that my liability is protected if I buy limited. So why don't I buy the vehicle through the car? If it doesn't work, I protect my asset. But that doesn't work in reality because when you take a limited company to the bank, remember I said it's like a little person, you take it along to the bank and say, hey, Mr. Bank, limited company XY wants to borrow 15 grand for a new car. I mean, that's a cheap car, isn't it? 15 grand. <laughs> um, they would credit score the company. Because the company has no credit score, they go, we can't lend a limited company, but you personally have a good credit score. So if you sign a, sign a director's guarantee, we'll lend the company the money. I've signed the guarantee, I'm taking the liability. So I don't think that's, you know, I don't I, I don't see why Celebrity would want to do that. The only other reason that you'd want to start as a limited company is when your revenue is so high that you're going to start hitting the 40% income tax level. Yes. At that point, in a limited company, I could split my incomes between salary and dividends and reduce my tax burden. Um, but you've got to be earning quite a lot. Of, I mean, I, I think it'd be hard pressed as a, as a celebrant to do the job well and conduct that many ceremonies that that's going to be an issue for you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the third option, which you could have, is if you had two celebrants and say one of them was really great at people, love talking to funeral directors and organising it. The other person was more kind of like, I don't mind doing the services, but I love building websites and doing social media. So they decided they wanted to work together. You could have a partnership. Partnership is just a collection of sole traders underpinned by a single legal document. The laws are slightly different in Scotland than they are in the mainland, but it's still available. And in that case, the thing to be mindful of, if you have a good in that route, is the legal phrase is joint and severally liable which means every individual partner is liable for the full debt of all the partners. So again, that could be slightly risky as well. So I would anticipate that for 99.9% .9 of all celebrants, um, definitely in the funeral space, um, I see there'd always be so traders. Arguably, possibly you get to the 40% income tax if you're a very expensive wedding celebrant, possibly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that thing about partnership is really interesting as well, because I think that there are a number of celebrants who are kind of setting up a collective. So that's really valuable advice on that one if, as well. If, if they do that, the key thing is they need to have a partnership agreement. Yes. Four or five people saying we're partners, doesn't matter unless it's got a legal document behind it. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. There's um, I'll, 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 I'll name drop the website because they are a three, a three service, is Rocket Lawyer. Rocket Lawyer, they can download a template for a partnership or sign it give it to a solicitor to store it and you're covered so i definitely even in a partnership i i would say you've got to have that legal document between you um to make sure that you know exactly because again what would normally happen um firms like accountants and lawyers tend to be partnerships so within their legal agreement it will say they agree a maximum liability and the reason you do that is again i don't think it applies to celebrants but if you're an accountant you can see one accountant out of 20 makes the wrong decision and suddenly the liability for everybody is you owe millions of pounds. So you can build within that that each partner is only liable to a maximum of like 100K. But again, that's more for knowledge than I think would affect celebrants. Yeah. And, and on that idea of a million pounds, I'm going to ask a million dollar question. Well, I think actually it's not a million dollar question because if we went down this route, we would have HMRC in our doorstep. But in terms of our own uh, tax and expenses, what, what can we reasonably claim against and what can't we claim against? So before I answer that, I'm going to tell you the thing which trips most people up when they launch a business, because I think this is the key one. Is So most of us are used to being employees. So as an employee, you get your pay packet through and your tax has been removed, your pension has been removed. So whatever's left, you get to spend. The advantage of being a sole trader is when the money comes, it's all yours. 
you spend the first and you're taxed at the end of the year. That will eventually change to being done quarterly, but at the moment it's still annually. Now, the difference there is, is that we pay tax as we go as an employee. When you become self-employed, you pay tax in arrears, which means let's stick with the basic tax rate. I will save 20% of what I earn for my tax bill at the end of the year. Fantastic. The problem that we have is that is when you hit a certain amount of money as self-employed, they'll change the rules on you. So what do I mean by that? Normally, you pay as you go. Once you hit this magic threshold, which I think celebrants would if they're you know just moderately busy, what will happen is they'll change the rules. So rather than paying as you go, they'll put you on to uh, twice annual payments. And they charge you six months in advance and six months in arrears. The problem is it always happens at the end of the tax year. So if you save your 20%, like a good boy, all the way through the year, you get to April, you get the bill for all the money you've saved, plus 50% of that bill again for the first half of year two. Okay. So I'd always say when you're earning, I'd recommend maybe saving about 30% of your income over that first year to give you that bit of cushion to cover that extra kind of um, that bill, uh, not that bill, tax bill, because that will catch you out. And that that everyone gets that wrong. And it surprises everybody when it happens to them. So I thought I'd start with that one. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the next one is I'm going to say, I'll give a little bit of advice, but I would also say go to HMRC, go to the section on self-employment. And they have a series of on-demand webinars for the self-employed. Number one, number three are brilliant. Number two is a bit dry. But <laughs> they, if you want to know more, that will really work for you. Um, things you can't claim for is the obvious one if you've gone out there and you just bought yourself a lovely new italian suit to do your funeral in you can't claim for work clothing because you could wear that to a social event or a wedding not just when you're working so we can't claim for clothing and you could probably do the same thing if you're a limited company but it wouldn't wash as, no, a as a sole trader. trader yeah okay. because you've got that thing when i become a limited company i could be both the owner and an employee of that business um things which are worth knowing is that you can claim for use of your home as office space. So if you've got, they they ignore bathrooms and conservatories, any livable room in your house. So you work that out and go, okay, I've got five livable rooms in my house. And I use one room because I do all my admin, my prep, my research. So I'm using 20% of my property. So I can gain 20% back on my electricity. 20% of my water, 20% of my council tax. And I can also save, claim back 20%, make sure everyone's listening, 20% of the interest I pay on my mortgage. Those things we can claim for. Um, broadband, business broadband, that's a tax deductible. Mobile phone for business, tax deductible expense. So you're suddenly in a situation where you can buy office equipment and things and offset that. Um, you could, I use the example of buying a new car, you could buy a car for work. I have a separate car for funerals and the family car. Um, and then you've got a couple of schemes. One scheme, which is the easiest one to do, the one I use myself, which is literally you just clear fair usage. So in other words, need a new set of tyres? Tax deductible. Put petrol in the tank? Tax deductible. You can claim mileage, but for most people, the admin in the paperwork of doing that is more hassle than it's worth because you have to record all journeys, personal and pleasure in that car, so they can work out what percentage is of business use. Whereas what I would always say is, you know, for most people, uh, it's going to be probably, you might as well just go, I'm just going to claim for wear and tear, repair work, petrol put in the tank. That'll cover most of us. As a as a ballpark figure, if you were, and again, if you're, doing, if you're celebrant, I don't think this would ever happen. I would only switch to the other scheme if I was doing more than 30,000 miles a year for work. But if you're under that 30K a year for work, then you're more than likely not going to benefit from being on that program anyway. Um, so I, I would kind of avoid that one. Okay. Uh, professional memberships, your fee when you're renewed with APC, that's a tax deductible expense. You have given us a huge amount of um, food for thought today, Neil, and, and brilliant advice. So I hope that everybody out there has found this podcast particularly useful. I know that I've learned a number of things as well. So um, thank you for being with us today. And I'd, I'd like on behalf of the Academy of Professional Celebrants to, to thank you for your time. Um, you've been successful in business uh, many times over, but I hope that your celebrant business continues to go from strength to strength. And in a moment or two, we'll have the kind of traditional closing of the of the podcast with you reading a piece of poetry or prose that you find powerful when you read it at services. 
In the meantime, can I remind everybody out there to get in contact with me if you have any ideas or if you want to take part in future podcasts. And the email address for that is Derek at apcuk.org. Neil, thank you again so much for today. It's been hugely informative. Can you close with that little piece? Tell us a little bit about it. And um, thanks again for talking with me and our best wishes moving forward. No, it's been my absolute pleasure, Derek, and always happy to, to to support the brilliant work which the APC has done and the experience which I've had. Um, yes, bit of poetry. There are so many great poems. I mean, we were chatting before, and you're going to send me some more, which is which is amazing. Um, but the one I've opted to go for is one for me, which was part of that heart connection. So it's actually a poem called "My Mum" by Michael Ashby, which I actually gave as part of my 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 mum's funeral service, and uh, but is very powerful for any mum out there, I'm sure. Where did it go? My mother once asked. As the tick clock tick tocked and her life flew past. In the race against time, she led for most of the way. But the track was endless, unlike her last day. So polish up the stars and fire up the sun and put out some slippers to welcome my mum. Find a new galaxy and light up her name. Because life on planet Earth just won't be the same. You've been listening to the podcast of the Academy of Professional Celebrants. We'd love you to be part of our community. We offer training in all aspects of celebrancy. So why not check out our training program on our website to see if there's a course you can take part in. We have trained hundreds of celebrants who are now well established in their own business. Our post-training support network is second to none. And you can be sure that help and inspiration is never more than a message away. Keep looking out for more podcasts coming soon the academy of professional celebrants your success is our success